morning again. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. I know it seems a little late, and I know that in our culture, we always want to race through this period now. Get the decorations put away, get ready for New Year's, and then, and then of course, in the stores, getting ready for, uh, what would be the next, Valentine's Day. Already have? Oh, really? How sad. Uh, let's at least remind ourselves for a moment that the 12 days of Christmas is the way the historic church celebrates. We are day six of 12 days. Uh, in, a, in a liturgical church or historic church, whatever, uh, this, is, this Sunday is called Christmas 2. It's the second, no, it'd be Christmas 1. Sorry, Christmas 1, it's the first Sunday of the Christmas season. Now, just because of the way Christmas came and, and you know, of the, it's not on a weekend, an associated weekend, it kind of gives us a chance to have uh, a little extra time to talk about the fact that the story continues. You know, because if we're not careful, we jump ahead in the story of Jesus even. And we'll jump ahead to either the wise men or his baptism. And, or maybe even pause a moment at age 12 and get that story thrown in there. Then we race on to, to his ministry. And what we're going to do today is look at some very significant events that were happening when he was still a child. And I have to admit, I don't think I've preached on this before, either because I haven't had the occasion or I sense we needed to race to the next thing. But I want us to look at uh, what happened uh, about his circumcision and then presentation in the temple and what was so extraordinary about that because there's a lot of life lessons for us and if we really believe that Christmas is not just about an event that's behind us but a way of life and a heart condition then there's a whole lot of things to consider so I have a trivia question and it's really related what did the family want to call John the Baptist before he got the name John don't all speak at once. Let it flow off your tongue. Luke chapter 1. Did you miss the question? Okay. What? <laughs> you weren't paying attention. Yeah, but that, yeah. Okay. Matt, what, what was John the Baptist going to be called before he actually got the name John? Huh? Oh, you're close. What is it? Not Hezekiah, but Zechariah. So yeah, Zechariah. Good job. That's what, that's what Matt was going to say. Don't you think? Well, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Forgiveness before judgment. You know, that kind of... <laughs> the family had decided they're going to call him Zechariah after his father. And finally, the father spoke, Zechariah. Remember, he had been muted because he didn't believe the angel when he was, and that his, his elder uh, wife was going to have a child again. So he was, he was made mute for the entire pregnancy. But when they wanted to name him Zechariah... Zechariah spoke up and said, no, his name will be John. And everybody realized this is a miracle, this he's now speaking. And he breaks out into praise. When was he named John? When did that happen? At his circumcision. Uh, on the eighth day, which is when babies, according to the law, were circumcised. On the eighth day, his identity was confirmed. No, his name is John. And, and I don't know whether in that, in that time, in that age, they felt that, you know, we, we aren't going to confirm the name at, at birth. We're going to wait a few days and see what name kind of emerges. And they were certain it would be a family name. And he says, no, John, the name that the angel had given. Why is that significant? Because let's just recognize in that culture, the name was of extraordinary significance, and it was confirmed on the eighth day, on, on the day of circumcision. Now... Why eight days? Why not 12 days? Eighth day was named. And, and some of maybe historically, maybe why a baptism font has eight sides, as ours does. We built this to have eight sides. Uh, many believe, since it's a, a number that's not in scripture very often, that it refers to the seven days, natural days of creation. And this is the new creation, the new life. So this is the new life. This is the symbol of the new life. Uh, and, and maybe it is that for uh, a boy being circumcised on the eighth day because now he is coming into the blood covenant. Now he has identity. Now he has purpose. He's in the community of uh, the blood that we recognize as the blood of, blood of our Lord himself. But uh, that, that naming of the child, it wasn't like we do nowadays where you have to have the name of the child by the time they're, they're born. Why? 
Because the birth certificate. Because in our culture, you have to have an identity. You have to, the government says, we have to know the name right away. So that becomes the naming of the child. And in fact, so many people have asked us, what's the name of your granddaughter going to be in, in a couple weeks? And they haven't made that public. We're not sure. But certainly by the time she's born, we hope we know what we're going to call her. But see, in this culture, when was the name significant? The eighth day. Just like in baptisms, you'll hear me say in just a few moments, name this child. That's when it becomes official. As a matter of fact, I thought I'd just tell you a little trivia. Uh, when I was born, I wasn't expected to live. There was an emergency baptism at the hospital, and I wasn't named Fred. I was named, I'm not going to tell you because you know. <laughs> I was actually, my name was, was for a few days, uh, Donald. Do I look like a Don? I don't think so. No, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. But when I lived, and then my dad decided to have a real baptism in the church, horrible, horrible theology, but that's what it was. In those days, that's what happened. Horrible theology. I was baptized again, and I was given the name. So then when the priest said, name this child, out came my dad's own name. He just tagged a junior. So that's why I'm Fred, or Frederick. It was naming that child, that's when it's significant. Now, Turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 2, because the story continues. And we need to see what's going on, because it's not just another verse that we jump over to get to the next story. Luke chapter 2, verse 21, we're going to start, and we're going to look at the, the continuation of the, the unfolding story of the birth and subsequent narratives of our Lord himself. At the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the, in the womb. Now, of course, let's recognize, he wasn't given the name Jesus because they didn't speak English. What name was he given? Yeshua. Yeshua, Yeshua. Yeshua which we translate as Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Now, Yeshua, it, how do we pronounce that name in a, in a Hebrew derivation is Joshua, Yeshua. Why is that significant? Because as soon as that name was given, anyone who was present would have thought, Joshua, he delivered us. He got us out of the desert. He led the battles and got us into the promised land. It's that name. <coughs> what does the name Jesus mean? Savior. It's, it's the Isaiah 51, you know, the, that whole mystery that he, will, he, he, was, he died for our transgressions, that he paid the price for our sins. This is his name. This is his identity. Does that make sense? This is a huge event in the life of our Lord because now the cosmic shift has occurred. The Savior is here. The Messiah has come. He's come to earth. Now, I mentioned a couple weeks ago when we had that earthquake, we were in the zone, our house was in the zone where, where our, our house violently shook. Jill was still recovering. She had gotten up a couple hours uh, earlier and gone down on the couch. I was upstairs, the bed was shaking so much I was awoken, and I got up to check to see if she was all right. I'm coming down the stairs and she says, the house was shaking. I said, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and of course, trying to figure out tectonic plates and all the movement. This is a spiritual tectonic plate. The name has just been made public. This name that the angels had given to Mary and to make sure it was sealed, the name was given to Joseph as well in the dream, remember? There was no question what his name was going to be. It was defined by heaven because that's his identity. He is the Savior. His name is above every name. His name is the, the name that at that knee, every knee will bow. It's that name that Jesus says, in my name you will do greater things. That is, we will continue this amazing work of the spread of the kingdom. Why? Because we know the name. We live by the name. We live under the name, the name of our Savior. This is the day he gets the name. Now, the question is, do we live under that name? Have you taken time even today to just reflect on the name? Gaze at the beauty of who he is in our lives. Have you considered that amazing mystery that we don't have to live by our own name? We don't at all. We live by the name of Jesus. That's the power we have in prayer, isn't it? Now, granted, there are exceptions to prayers in Scripture that don't offer the name of Jesus. The Lord taught the Lord's Prayer. It doesn't end in the name of Jesus. Well, he hadn't gone to the cross yet. 
But obviously, we're taught that the power, the authority we have to come into the throne room of God is we end our prayer with, in the name of Jesus. Anybody can pray to God. We know what his name is. In the name of Jesus, I offer this prayer. And then it has power. And we live under that authority as well. The name of Jesus. You know that, don't you? Have you thought about that today? See, that's what we're celebrating. Now, in fact, it's the eight, this, today isn't the eighth day. It's the sixth day. So this is, in our calendar, January. It will be January 1st, the eighth day. But isn't that kind of cool? Just in the way things work. The way God is so ordained that the first uh, day of every year is the day that we remember the name of Jesus. This is the year I live under the name of Jesus. This is the year I'm going to look forward to the favor of God. This is the year I'm going to be blessed by God because I'm living under the name. Are you? Are you trying to make a name for yourself? Or are you thinking your name is all that important? This is what we celebrate today. And isn't it wondrous that we have, uh, like in Sarah's son, to baptize today? To just be reminded of that, that we all get the name we all live under the name. We have that authority and power. But what's amazing is the story continues. Look at look what happens next. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now let's pause for just a moment. The, de- the time of presentation is, is day 40. And now he's, you know, 32 days later. Now it's time to present him in the temple. Why? Because he's a firstborn male. According to Exodus and Leviticus, the firstborn male was to be presented to the Lord. Uh, What's one of the great celebrations of that? Uh, Samuel. He was the firstborn uh, male. His mom presented him back to the Lord. And don't argue with any Irish family or Italian family, Roman Catholic, uh, and, and suggest that their sons, firstborn sons, don't belong to the Lord. Uh, that battle has continued and will continue for the generations, right? Alex, are you the firstborn? Yeah, okay, so you belong to the Lord. <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm the firstborn male in my family. There was no question. Well, it was for me. I didn't, I didn't believe it for a long time, but the firstborn... <laughs> now, it doesn't mean others don't belong to the Lord. David was the eighth. <laughs> I mean, to talk about the forgotten son who was out in the field. Okay, anybody belongs to the Lord, but it was just this mystery that the firstborn, who is the, the kinsman redeemer, belongs to the Lord. So that's what they're doing. And they're just going in the temple to do their duty, to present a blood sacrifice, the turtle doves, and, and, and so that they can acknowledge that their firstborn son really belongs to the Lord. It was in accordance with the law. They were doing their duty as faithful parents, presenting their child to the Lord. But the story goes on. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit in the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him in his arms and blessed God, saying, Lord, now, le- now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts may re- be revealed." Now, first, let's, let's recognize there's not a lot of people in Scripture who are called holy and righteous. So already, this is a very remarkable man named Simeon. We are also told that he had the Holy Spirit upon him. That is, he's anointed. You've heard me use that language often. There's many ways the Holy Spirit works in our lives. One of the ways is upon us. Like an, like an arm, rest, a hand resting upon a shoulder. It's why we use that language of laying on of hands. It's the anointing of God. The power of God has come upon him. The power to be what? To be a prophet. Now, let's put ourselves in history for a moment. A what? A prophet? They're back? Yes, they're back. Started with Zechariah. Yes, we'd say a bit with John the Baptist when he gets his ministry going. 
But Simeon comes as a prophet into a nation that hasn't seen a prophecy in hundreds of years since the time of Malachi. They have not had prophets. There was a famine of the word of God. But Jesus is here now. His name is made public on the earth, and everything's changed. Now we have people who are speaking God's word to us so we can understand when we see the word in our midst. Does that make sense? This is a huge perspective. And yes, isn't it interesting? God's perfect timing. He's also led by the Spirit. That is, the Spirit is working within him as well and guides him the temple to just be ready. And he's there and recognizes the child. In the midst of what was probably tens of thousands of people in the temple area. Simeon sees in the Spirit who he's, who he's been looking for for his life. Isn't that cool? He gets it. Simeon gets it. And he breaks into the Song of Simeon, the Nunc Dimittis. <laughs> this is, that's a Latin name for, the, for this very familiar song. And I say so familiar that if we were living a couple hundred years ago and we practice the, the daily offices of prayer, either the fourfold cycle of four times a day in prayer or sevenfold cycle that some nuns and, and monks still practice, we would know this by heart. Because in, in the final prayer of each day, called Compline, that's the last cycle of prayer at the end of the day. And the very last prayer offered in that short little prayer before you go to sleep is, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace in accordance with your word. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you prepared for all the world to see, a light to enlighten the nations and the glory of your people Israel. What's the mystery of that? I'm getting chills even using that. Because we are people who walk with the word, Jesus. And if we know the word, then we're at peace. And we don't have to have anything else in the world. And so we can go to bed at, 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 at in peace. And we know if the Lord wants to call us home, that's OK, because we're at peace. That's the privilege we have of accepting this prophecy. That because Jesus is now here, Simeon can say, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace. Now, what's also interesting, the word he uses here, Lord, capital L, little o, little r, little d, isn't used to describe normally the Godhead. It's used to describe the king. Most commentators believe he is praying to Jesus. <laughs> He is praying to the baby, saying, Lord, now let thou servant depart in peace. I've seen you, and it's good enough for me. I don't need to hear about the cross. I don't need to hear all the teachings. I don't need all the parables. I don't need to be one of your disciples. I know who you are, and it's good enough for me, Lord. If you want to call me home, I'm ready. Do you realize the power of that? Now, let, let's, let's consider something else. Can you imagine what that must have meant for Mary and Joseph? Still trying to figure out, what is God doing? They had the name given to Mary. They had the name given in a dream to Joseph. OK, they'd done the naming. Now they're in the midst of all these people in this environment of the temple. They're trying to just dedicate their son in the day of purification, dedicating him to the Lord. And this total stranger comes out and speaks a prophetic word and actually describes him in the way that they could only have known. And they're probably still scratching their head about the, angel, the uh, angels who had visited the shepherds and what the shepherds had told them just a few weeks before. Can you imagine how encouraging this is to them? And isn't it wonderful? That's what God does to us. Whenever there's big change, whenever there's big movement, he comes along in some of the most unusual ways and encourages us. But then this righteous and holy man turns to Joseph and Mary and blesses them. And then speaks a prophetic word to Mary, saying, your soul's going to suffer also. The sword's going to pierce you. It's the offense of Jesus, and you're carrying him. The world will be offended at this. And isn't it nice to know ahead of time what, even if it's going to be difficult, that it's named ahead of time and you know it's from God? And Simeon gives that encouragement and that blessing and cautions her about her faith. That's what God does. 
he, he creates these timely events if you're seeking to, to live for him. And all of a sudden, you get this, this blessing out of nowhere, right? Well, you're pretty quiet today, right? Yeah. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. The one I just heard from Friday. Correct me if I'm wrong, because I just heard, I heard the story once from Jill. Um, you all remember, uh, I shouldn't say y'all. Sorry. Some of you remember a few years ago that we had renters at our house, Daniel and Michelle Bird. It was a young couple. They lived in our basement apartment. They were here for three years and uh, often would sit in the front row with us, Michelle especially, when she was, fr when she was free. And um, she's very clear about her testimony that she found the Lord and gave her life to the Lord uh, at Church of the Messiah. She tells people that everywhere. Well, she has been a general manager at Panera Bread for years. A couple years ago, she was made the general manager of catering for the whole region. So it's a general manager level, but she travels around all the stores coordinating the catering. She felt led in the Lord to go to the senior executives of Panera and say, would it be all right if she put up a giving tree in each of the stores, each of the restaurants? And they agreed. How many stores? 25 stores. She's setting up uh, trees with, with various names and, and other things that people can give to. And you can imagine, she got lots of things, gifts and uh, stuffed animals and all sorts of things, financial gifts and all, to be given away. Well, she heard about Goshen Valley, uh, the significant foster program that we have here in the county. As a matter of fact, if you come to the service tonight, we want you to bring an offering, because the offering is going to Goshen Valley tonight at our Power and Unity service. It is one of the crises in our county. We do not have enough foster families for the, for the need in Cherokee County. So churches across the county are trying to raise that raise the consciousness for financial giving and for families who would be willing to, to sponsor a child or a family. So she heard about that from Jill. So she, she tracked down Goshen Valley's phone number, called. Remarkably, Zach, the, the, the president, answered and made arrangements to meet with her, as you would if you were responsible for, for that ministry. So he went over to one of the Paneras, met with her, and they're, they're chatting. And he says, how do you ever hear about Goshen Valley? And she said, well, I gave my life to Christ at Church of the Messiah. And, uh, we, we actually lived uh, with the pastor and his wife for three years. And Zach said, you live with Fred and Jill? <laughs> and she said, yeah, you know them? He says, yeah, I've known them for years. <laughs> and, and he said, well, I'm just really blessed to think you're doing that for our children. And uh, he said, I I'd love to coordinate a little more. Um, so when do you want to meet back here? And she said, well, to be honest, I don't live in this area. I live over in Canton. He said, really? I live in Canton. He said, where do you live? And she said, well, I, I'm over uh, towards Bridge Mill on Sixes Road. He said, really? That's where I am. <laughs> and, and, and he said, what neighborhood do you live in? And it's, it's Copper, Copper Creek. And she said, well, I'm in Copper Creek. And he said, I'm in Cocker, Copper Creek. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, but you probably don't know my area. I'm in that little section uh, uh, just off to the side. I'm not in that part of the main section. And she went, I am too. <laughs> they found out they live on the same street. And then she admitted they've been trying to foster children. And he said, I'll conduct the home, home interview myself. I'll walk down the street to your house. Perfect timing. God does that, as he does with Simeon, to bless Mary and, and Joseph and Jesus. And so he would receive the blessing. God brings people together if we're seeking the Lord. If we're seeking ourselves, but when you seek the Lord, things happen, don't they, church? Thank you. I can give you 10 more stories, but, um, but that's what God does. And that's one of the great lessons we have to celebrate here. If you're not seeing the hand of God at work, maybe you're not seeking God enough. Let me just say, now there are dry seasons to be sure. We call it desert experiences. There are times when you wonder, God, where are you? But the more we seek the Lord, the more he can allow those events to happen. And hopefully we'll see the Lord's hand in it. What's remarkable is the story doesn't end here. So we continue. And, verse 36, there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day, and coming up 
uh, that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Now, first let me pause and, and mention, in the Greek, the language isn't quite that clear. It does seem to indicate either she was 84 or had lived as a widow for 84 years, or she was actually 84 years after the seven years she had. So she was at least 91 years since she became a virgin. This is a very old woman. <laughs> at least 84, if not 91, and maybe 100. She's a very old woman. But what do we know her as? A woman of deep devotion. Daily prayer. Listening to the Lord. Oh, no, yes, she's there too. And she starts telling everybody about this baby Jesus. Do you know, when we're deep in prayer, if we commit ourselves to that, uh, we see things that others don't see, right? We see things that others don't see. If you want to have an extraordinary 2019, commit yourself more than ever, not to a New Year's resolution that you'll, you'll drop in three or four weeks, but commit yourself to a lifestyle of being known as a person of deep devotion and you will see things that no one else sees. As I said, there may have been tens of thousands of people in that temple. Anna saw and knew, this is the one. And again, the parents get more encouragement. It's now public. This is the Jesus. This is the Messiah. He's the one. And people are coming and saying, yeah, he's the one. He's the one. He's the one. But the story continues. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Okay, what does that mean? How does that work? What's the timing? We Westerners always want to know that. Did they go to back to Galilee and then return to Jerusalem within a couple of years? So the wise men found them in that house, because most of the time it's believed that Jesus was probably about age two when the wise men came. Or are they referring to going to the Galilee years after, after they had fled and gone to Egypt? How does that all work? We don't know. We don't know what time frame he's referring to. But what is spoken next is wonderful. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom and the favor of God. Sometimes translated grace of God, but this, this sweet word can be translated the favor of God was upon him. The favor of God. Proverbs chapter 12 says, A good man obtains favor from the Lord. So does a good woman. Do you want to live the next year under the favor of God? Do you want others then to recognize that? Because that's what's happening here. People are recognizing the favor of God is upon him. It's a sweet place to live. Because what it means is you don't take credit for anything. You give all that desire up. Because all you want is the Lord and his glory. You see, when we seek to live a life, when we seek to live a life of holiness and righteousness before God, of living a life pleasing to God, then we're always surrendering to him. We're always seeking his will for his purposes and for his glory. And God says, yes, here's my favor. More than any other year, I want to live next year under the favor of God. Because I do not want to be defined by what I do. I want to be defined by who I am. I want to be defined as a man of God. And I'd like people to think I'm a good man. Because I want to know the favor of God. Don't you? Let's stop playing the game that somehow we can have our cake and eat it too. That we can be really successful Americans. And we can be faithful Christians. Why don't we just give all that up and say, Lord, just for you. What are, what are the, what are, what's the meat of all these little stories? First, name of Jesus. Changes everything. Name of Jesus in your life is the God changer because God is then present each time you, you invoke his name. And you become increasingly aware of the blessings you have in Jesus. Second, we need to listen to prophets because they're present. If someone encourages us, speaks a word, you know they're, they're connected with God. It confirms things for you. Need to listen. That's probably the Lord speaking to you. 
And as a matter of fact, he's got even in this community some holy and righteous people who speak God's word often. It's, in, it's within this community. It's extraordinary. And their words will encourage us and will bless us. And if we're walking with the Lord, there's a peace that passes all understanding. We don't have to be anxious. We don't have to be troubled. We don't have to go, what if? We don't have to play that game anymore. We don't even have to play the game of if only. We can just be in his peace. And oh yes, as we do, others will come along like Anna. And you go, her? Yeah, her. Seeing what others don't see because of the prayer life she lives. And she sees the glory. Don't you want to see the glory? Sees the glory of God. And it's okay. And yes, the lesson from Jesus himself. If we commit ourselves to being a good man or woman or teen or child, the favor of God. There's no more wondrous place to be. Under that umbrella, the favor of God, whoa, it's going to be a great year. And now, isn't it amazing that we get to live that out now? With Corbin. It's, it's just, it's such a gift to be reminded again that we're named under Jesus, that we can start a new life no matter where we are. Now, in this church, it is true, we, we do baptize infants. We also dedicate infants if that's what the family wants. And we're very clear that it has to be the decision of the individual. There's no question about that. One day, he will make to have, have to make this decision on his own. But what we want to do is help him to have that decision made within the fellowship of the believers. So he will have to confirm that at another time. If we were dedicating him today, he'd have to be baptized at a later time. We're baptizing now, he'll have to confirm that at a later time. But we want him within the community of the faithful. So that's why we're baptizing. So, you ready? Who's going to go get him? Okay. And I'd like to have the Parents come forward, and godparents come forward, and any children who want to be close, come forward. Well, I might have Lauren hold him, and I'll baptize both of them just to make sure some splash. Oh, okay. Please present this uh, child for baptism. Will you be responsible for seeing that Corbin is brought up in the Christian faith and life? I will with God's help. That was pretty wimpy. It's all four of you, please. <laughs> I know, but it's parents and godparents. It's everybody who are making the commitment before the body. Will you be responsible for seeing that Corbin is brought up in the Christian faith and life? I will with God's help. Will you, by your prayers and witness, help Corbin to grow into the full stature of Christ? Do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? I renounce them. Do you renounce the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? I renounce them. Do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? I renounce them. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Savior? I do. Do you put your whole trust in his grace and love? I do. Do you promise to follow and obey him as your Lord? Now let's recognize that's what we were just reading about in the gospel. The favor of the Lord was recognized on Jesus because his parents were raising him to live that way. They are making a commitment out of their faith that their authority as mom and dad and godfather and godmother are that authority to allow, now allow Corbin to have the influence of being raised with his family under the favor of God. And now, will you who witness these vows do all in your power to support Corbin and his family in his life in Christ? We will. Now let us now stand and join with those who are committing Corbin, uh, Jace, to Christ and renew our own <laughs> baptismal covenant. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered death for Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living. Why are these words so significant? Because they're the words of the Apostles' Creed. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in the prayers? I will, God's help. will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? I will, God's help. will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? I will, God's help. will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? Will you strive for justice and peace among all the people and respect the dignity of every human being? I will, God's help. Then let us now pray for Corbin Chase, who is to receive the sacrament of new birth. Deliver him, O Lord, from the way of sin and death. Lord, hear our prayer. Open his heart to your grace and truth. Lord, hear our prayer. Fill him with your holy and life-giving spirit. Keep him in the faith and communion of your holy church. Lord, Teach him to love others in the power of the Spirit. Lord, Send him into the world in witness to your love. Lord, Bring him to the fullness of your peace and glory. Lord, Grant, O oh Lord, that all who are baptized into the death of Jesus Christ, your Son, may live in the power of his resurrection and look for him to come again in glory who lives and reigns now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also you. Let us pray. Blessed and holy, almighty Father, we thank you for the gift of water. Over it, the Holy Spirit moved in the beginning of creation. Through it, you led the children of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt into the land of promise. In it, your son Jesus was baptized and was anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Messiah. We thank you, Father, for the water of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death. By it, we share in his resurrection. Through it, we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in joyful obedience to your Son, we bring into his fellowship those who come to him in faith, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now sanctify this water, we pray you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that those who here are cleansed from sin and born again to the life of your Spirit may continue forever in the risen life of Jesus, our Savior. To him and to you and to the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. You want to come to me? You want to? Hi, buddy. Yeah, hi. You wait. <laughs> Name this child? Corbin Chase, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. A great mystery in this, isn't there? You may recall it was just a few days ago we all shared the light of Christ from the Christ candle. And now we do that again as we remind Corbin and his family receive the light of Christ and being among us as one who serves in his name. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and continue to guide you in growing his love and sharing it with the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us greet the newly baptized. Time to clap.